Hello, everyone, and welcome to Imperial Valley Desert Museum. We'll be getting underway in just a few minutes' time. Uh, thank you very much, though, for joining us for tonight's feature event, Evening with an Expert, featuring author, historian, ethnographer Don Laponi, as he presents on La Rumorosa Rock Arts. We'll be getting underway in just a few minutes. Seems like we have a great room here joining us in this evening. We're up to 48, sorry, 49 participants now. Uh, so we still have a few folks chiming on in. We're just gonna let that and give them a chance to jump on in here. Uh, in the meanwhile, for those of you who have not had the chance yet to experience Imperial Valley Desert Museum or are not yet familiar with it, my name is Dr. David Breckner. I'm the executive director and I'll be your host this evening, um, introducing our main speaker of the night, our visiting expert, Don Laponi. Now, we also have, uh, as part of our evening with an expert this evening, an opportunity for you to do what we call a dine with us option, a cook with us option. Traditionally, an evening with an expert event is held in the Imperial Valley Desert Museum, where you can take in the exhibits you see right behind me. But due to COVID-19, we were uh, able to adapt and re-envision this as a virtual series. And we still wanted to have the effect of what those nights usually were which constitute a three course meal, good conversation with good company, and of course, a talk that's thematically relevant to the world around us, uh, particularly here in Southern California. So if you have not yet had the opportunity, we are doing a dine with us option here tonight where you are provided a recipe and a series of a three course meal, an appetizer, entree, and dessert that if you're feeling intrepid, you can cook along with and enjoy with us here tonight. So uh, across the evening and starting right now, if you take a look in the chat section of Zoom, you will see that we are going to be providing a number of files and documents and other items, both in support of uh, Mr. Laponi's talk here tonight, as well as uh, for your own enjoyment. So do keep an eye on that. And certainly if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and we'll get to them across the evening. And we still have a few more folks joining us here. So we'll just be a few more minutes if you need to, feel free to grab yourselves a glass of something to drink and we'll be getting underway in just a uh, short minute. Well, that's good. This will be a really good talk. David, you can hear me, Ryan. I can, yes, Don. Uh, we are currently, you're actually speaking to the entire audience right now. <laughs> okay. Um, if you'd like to say any words mind, to uh, your uh, attendees here tonight, feel free to. Uh, keep in mind how you think this talk would go for a professional audience, which will be next in a couple of weeks. Um, anyway, just keep that in mind if you how you think this would go for uh, Arizona archaeology, if you have any guidance on that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute. Oh, not a problem. We'll be underway here in just a few minutes, and I'll signal you when we're ready. Now, while we wait uh, for the last few participants to join, we're currently up to 69 attendees. Uh, just as a show of hands here, if you wouldn't mind, I see we have a number of webcams. How many of you are familiar with Imperial Valley Desert Museum? And how many of you are coming to us for the first time? I see a few hands raised, but a number of people shaking their heads. And I, of course, recognize a few familiar faces here as well. It's good to have all of you uh, past attendees and past supporters back. And if this is your first time with Imperial Valley Desert Museum, Welcome. We're very glad to have you, and I think you've chosen a fantastic uh, first event by which to get to know us. Now, the Imperial Valley Desert Museum, we're located out in Southern California in the uh, county of Imperial in Ocotillo. If you've ever driven to or from San Diego on the I-8, we are that uh, large building south of the highway just before you have to go up the hill. 
uh, very easy to get to, about 90 minutes outside of San Diego. And if you are a resident of the Valley, we are 30 minutes from pretty much anywhere. So great way to get out, enjoy yourselves for an afternoon, and more importantly, experience some of the lesser known parts of our deserts. Imperial Valley Desert Museum has been a part of this community, serving the residents of Imperial Valley, Southern California, and Eastern San Diego County for almost 50 years. Uh, actually, 2023 is going to be our 50th anniversary. And in that time, we have been fulfilling our mission to preserve, interpret, and celebrate the deserts of Southern California through outstanding collections, education, and research programs. And what you're attending here tonight, our Evening with an Expert events, is just one of many very ways in which we choose to engage in that mission. And while we just wait for the last few people to join in here tonight, I'm happy to show you a few images and some uh, footage of our museum so that hopefully one day you feel inspired to take a trip out here and enjoy your local deserts. Well, Dom, we are currently at 76 participants. So if you're all right, I think we might get ourselves underway here. Oh, we make that 77. Uh, Carrie, not just yet. Uh, we are just getting ready to be started here. Appreciate the question. For those of you just joining us or uh, just joining the last few minutes, we were just waiting for the last few participants to join into the room. And we are about to get underway here now. So you should just be seeing two talking heads staring at you here. Uh, my name is Dr. David Breckner. I'm the Executive Director of the Imperial Valley Desert Museum. And joining us here uh, to my right on the camera, we have author, ethnographer, historian, Don Lapone, who is our speaker for the evening. And we're we'll getting underway here in just a moment. This we have a few last minute attendees. And while I, <laughs> oh, of course, and while we get underway here, I'm gonna be showing you just a few images of who we are and uh, what the Imperial Valley Desert Museum is about as an institution while we wait for the last few. Now the Imperial Valley Desert Museum is located in, in Ocotillo, California. If you have never visited us before, we're located right off the I-8 interstate connecting San Diego to Yuma. Uh, if you happen to be in San Diego, we're about 90 minutes east of you. And if you're in Imperial Valley, well, why haven't you come visit us yet? Uh, currently, the museum is closed to the public due to COVID-19. But just last week, the County of Imperial and State of California did allow for the limited reopening of museums in Imperial County. And we are uh, very quickly finishing all existing uh, longstanding projects so that we can reopen to you in the very near future. Uh, some of those projects do include also staff vaccinations so that when we do reopen, we can ensure a safe and secure environment for all of our guests and patrons moving forward. Now, the Imperial Valley Desert Museum uh, was first established and founded in 1973. 
as an Imperial Valley College Desert Museum. And uh, the bulk of our original materials, which you might have seen as the pottery behind me on my first screen, uh, maybe even right now, came to us from that early 1970s efforts. Our founders, Javon Warloff, Michael Barker, and Moreland Childers, helped to document and evidence a history of early man and its adaptation in the Imperial Valley going back at least 10,000 years, making the Imperial Valley one of the most significant locations in our studies of peoples in the Americas. And that evidence is all around us, which is why it's the mission of the Imperial Valley Desert Museum to preserve, interpret, and celebrate those deserts through outstanding collections, education, and public programming. Now, if you've ever visited our exhibit floor, you will know that we are committed to the idea of interactive, engaging exhibits. The idea being to bring the desert inside, to connect you to the narrative of the land itself. Our mission is not just to tell the story of the people or of the land, but rather of the two of them together and how it's an evolving narrative of how we live even today in a land of extremes and how that land is constantly changing and evolving. So too, must we adapt to find a way to survive and thrive in it. We cover everything from early tools and adaptations to the history of water in Imperial Valley going back 10 million years when we were first part of the Gulf of California to providing opportunities for you to go out and hike without actually having to expend the effort. Uh, to also just highlighting the sheer diversity and uh, extent of early adaptations, uh, be it through pottery, stone tools, or more uh, uh, perishable items such as sandals and other clothing and uh, hunting features. Now, the Imperial Valley Desert Museum is not only just an exhibit floor, it is also a place of active learning and research. Uh, about one third of our museum space, our entire mu museum building is dedicated to uh, materials and cultural collections, care, storage, and stewardship. We retain and steward over 30,000 objects in material culture, documenting 10,000 years of history right here in Southern California. And it's our part of our mission to not only keep it, uh, care for it, ensure its survival and uh, availability for the future generations, but to make sure that they're available. And this means that we have researchers, students from local colleges, and of course, field trips coming through and enjoying and engaging with this history on a nearly daily basis. And in furtherance of this, we have a number of public events, much like the one we're doing here tonight, our evening with an expert. Now, the IVDM Evening with an Expert series it was first conceived several years ago as an opportunity to bring local expert opinions and perspectives on matters relating to Southern California to the people of Southern California. And this event here tonight, La Rumorosa Rock Art, Volume 2, is the first event of that, of that Evening with an Expert series for our spring 2021 season. Now, the Imperial Valley Desert Museum has, num has a number of other events that we host occurring uh, across the year. Traditionally, when we are open and it is not a uh, national pandemic, global pandemic, we have public events including Octio War Day, Octio Rocks, Octio Blooms, where we can invite children out to experience the joys and the precious nature of water, have geocutting demonstrations, scavenger hunts, live butterfly releases, and much more. Unfortunately, we have had to go to a slightly uh, more uh, restricted format here moving forward. But this event, much like all the others that we're hosting over the current year, are provided free for our audiences and then afterwards made available free for people to watch on YouTube and the museum's website for years to come. Uh, in the meanwhile, in addition to these projects and in addition to these events, the museum has been very busy over the coming months with a number of big projects, which we are very excited to show you when we do reopen. Those projects include a complete renovation of our exhibit floor with new carpets, new climate controls, and very soon new exhibits. On the exterior, we are currently working to install and premiere 30 new outdoor signs, which will allow you to experience the same quality of educational and uh, ex uh, engagement content from the museum interior along our walking trails so that you can connect and better associate plants, animals, heritage, landmarks, all with your own eyes while you're walking outside. 
And of course, while you're outside, you can visit our Desert Tortoise, Speedy. Uh, in addition to all that, we've also just completed this past year a major renovation of our collection storage area, which allows us to better care for and receive new collections to keep local history local and available to our local audiences. Now, in addition to tonight's event, we do have some great upcoming events, which might interest you. Uh, starting next week on Saturday, the museum is starting is running a uh, partnering with the American Red Cross to provide the Be Red Cross Ready program. Over the course of several weeks, we'll be offering different classes covering a variety of emergency scenarios where your household can, where you and your household can evaluate your preparedness for local emergencies. Items on, and those emergencies cover everything from home fires and COVID-19 to more uh, themed ones here for Southern California, including earthquakes, flash floods, and of course, heat waves. If you're a business owner, we have two different events for you as well. We have the Ready Rating Program, where you and your business can evaluate uh, how you are doing and how you are prepared to care for both your staff and your guests, uh, your business partners, your patrons, if an emergency were to strike. And then finally, on April 10th, next month, we have our second evening with an expert speaker, Peter DeJong, speaking on Habitats in Flux, conservation in the Colorado, in the Colorado uh, desert, looking at critically endangered and threatened species right here in our own backyard and the efforts done to take care of them and conserve them for the future. Uh, if you are interested in any of these events, they are all live and hosted for you via Zoom. And I will be posting the link for that in the chat here if anybody has an interest. Just give me one moment to post that up. And in addition to tonight, in addition to tonight's uh, main feature, which is our, of course, our speaker, Don Lapone, we are offering a cook with me option. So if you have not yet decided what your dinner, uh, dinner selection will be this evening, we do have a menu and recipes for you to cook along. That menu includes uh, caprese salad, spaghetti with shrimp, lemon, and snow peas, and a strawberry shortcake for dessert. And the links on the recipe booklet for that is provided for you here now coming up in the uh, chat box as well. Now, if you do enjoy this event and would like to learn more about other upcoming events as well, you can certainly please uh, add and subscribe to our events mailing lists. Uh, all you need to do for that is simply put uh, in, your, in the chat box here, leave your name, email, phone, and address so we can put you into our system and we'll be able to contact you in the future with all these other upcoming events. And if you enjoy this and would like to support the museum in its efforts, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. You can become a member or a business sponsor of IVDM and allow us to continue to bring this great quality of content and programming to the communities of Southern California. Uh, I will be posting and providing in the chat the applications for both the business and the membership uh, if you have an interest in either. And there's a question concerning the recipes. Uh, the recipes should be coming up right now in the chat section. And the business sponsorship and the uh, membership applications are now loading in the chats as well. All right, and with that in mind and all the other details, uh, sorted out and the introductions provided, I would like to turn our attention here to tonight's feature event, our Evening with an Expert. The Evening with an Expert series allows experts such as Don, uh, Mr. Laponi here to present on their areas of work, uh, oftentimes before the next round of their publication. And in this case, Don Laponi is both a uh, doctor, PhD, ethnographer, historian, and an author. Uh, his work has included both La Rumorosa Rock Art, Volume 1, and La Rumorosa Rock Art, Volume 2. He is currently working on Volume 3, which will be the next in an ongoing series of his discussions, explorations, and uh, promotion, and of course, advocacy for the preservation of these valuable rock art sites just on the southern side of our U.S.-Mexico border. Now, certainly we encourage and would love to see your participation here for tonight. If you have any questions, they are absolutely welcome. We just ask that you please do keep your mics muted and post the uh, questions directly in the chat. 
and Don or myself will be answering them at the end. Uh, if it's a chat, if it's a question directed at me, I will answer that across the evening here as well. Uh, finally, I would just love to also point out just how remarkable and fortunate we are to have Mr. Laponi here today. I first met Don several years ago uh, through some of our partnerships in the local region. Uh, just east, just west of us here in eastern San Diego County, there's the Mountain Empire Unified School District, uh, which hosts a sizable population of Kumeyaay students. Now, the Kumeyaay are one of the many indigenous groups to our region out here today, and we, the museum actually resides on traditional Kumeyaay lands. Now, in the Mountain Empire, em, Mountain Empire Unified School District, Mr. Laponi worked with IVDM to facilitate not one, but two donations of several hundred uh, books to these students, documenting and pro uh, providing new discussion on their history and heritage on these otherwise overlooked and oftentimes forgotten sites. Most recently, Mr. Laponi has become a major advocate of an upcoming internship program that he has helped co-sponsor. This internship program hosted at IVDM and starting next summer will provide up to, I think it's 10 Kumeyaay graduating seniors in yeah, high school, yeah. the opportunity to not only experience and engage with their culture, but to learn and gain professional job experience in the fields of museum management and cultural resource management, allowing them to take ownership and seize control of their own heritage and its presentation and preservation for the future. Now, if you have any questions about this or would like to engage with us in any way, I'm happy to answer these questions either during the presentation or afterwards, and I'm sure Mr. Laponi will as well. Likewise, if any of these books or anything else that Mr. Laponi speaks tonight has your interest, the museum is happy to accommodate you there. Uh, I will be taking any orders you have for volume one or volume two through uh, the chat, or you can feel free to give us a call directly and I'll take your information at that point. And if you can't come in to see us, don't worry, we can actually mail the books to you as well. Uh, any final questions before we get underway here? I see we have a lot of comments and discussions, which is great. All right. With that in mind, then, Don, show is yours. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Let's try this. There we are. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me, but uh, if you can't, let David know. Uh, this is the, the cover of the second book with some of the main contributors. Uh, I wanna stress going in that uh, there's a few names on the cover, but at least 50 Native Americans, scientists and um, avocationalists participated in this effort uh, that went over about 10 years. Uh, all of the people on the cover probably walked hundreds of miles to find what you're gonna enjoy in the next hour. Sorry, so, Don, just to let you know, uh, we still are not seeing your screen here. Well, we can see you, but I think you were looking to show us the screen. There we go. Are we getting there? Uh, oh. Yes, uh, you might just want to go full screen uh, for the slide, but you were all set. Uh, one second. No problem. Okay, are we there? Uh, you want to go to slideshow? Oh yes, now you're all set. Okay, and you can hear all right. David, we're good? Yes, you're all set there, Don. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to mute my mic here now so I don't interrupt. <laughs> all right, sorry everyone, let's get rid of that. Let's start over. <clears throat> um, these are some of the people involved in this project. Uh, there are about 50 more or less full-time participants over the last decade uh, to produce the two books. Um, we're working on a third book, uh, more of a professional treatment uh, for online uh, distribution. And the fourth book that David did not mention 
Uh, the whole purpose of this is the fourth book will be written by a Kumeyaay scientist. And that's kind of the point of this uh, class, which is written for the internship program. So you'll get to see what the format is and the level of teaching. Uh, I've hiked with many of these kids and they really are sharp. And I think uh, one of the most worthwhile things we can do in San Diego is allow them the opportunity to get there. So that's, we'll talk about that a little bit more. This cover image is from the Kofa Wilderness on the very western edge of Arizona on the eastern side of the Colorado River. So we see what we think is a hunter with an arrow in mid-flight, a very tiny black line uh, and a bighorn sheep under a desert sky. And I think in the next hour, uh, hopefully we'll get to understand more than that about these types of photos. Hang on one second. So the Kumeyaay tell us directly, and there is a lot of ethnography in writing the third book I have found uh, going through the, the UC Berkeley archives, which is where a lot of this information was collected, uh, nearly 300 ethnographic citations. Now, ethnography is based upon people interviewing or living with the Indians, in this case, the Kumeyaay. Um, so there's a huge archive there. Some people say, well, you don't really know what they did or why they painted in that. And that's just simply not true. Uh, we do know in general terms, of course, you could not know what exactly was going through the mind of the person that painted this painting, but you know in principle uh, what was behind the painting. <clears throat> and so one of the, in archeology span today of 2021, one of the biggest debates, and archaeology has contentious debates. It's, uh, I found in my experience, it is not always polite. And there have been a number of um, really vociferous uh, debates about different things. And one of the ones going around now is the concept of alterity. And what that means uh, is portrayed on the right side of the slide, how we look at things as archaeologists or scientists is not how other people look at them. And uh, one of the complaints about these other cultures, Native American or otherwise, is that we do not understand what they were doing. And that's true. And so an effort is underway now to have some Kumeyaay and Native American and some of these other cultures that were studied to have them um, be scientists, but also their heritage and to blend that into a closer approximation of the truth. Um, we're going to have a couple of slides with some words on them, and I'm just going to hit the principles because this entire handout, and there's also a sister handout on your chat uh, compartment with uh, vocabulary meanings, and the vocabulary uh, applies to any of the underlying words in this handout are explained in the supplemental handout. And the since the handout just went online, so, it's in the chat. Yeah, since it's all available to you uh, forever, I'm just gonna hit on some highlights here so we don't get just bogged down in verbiage and you get to see some images. But anyway, that being said, the next couple of slides have some concepts. So um, La Rumorosa is a style of rock art it covers most of Southern California, Northern Baja, California, and Southwest Arizona, and also up the Colorado River as far as the Grand Canyon, Havasupai Canyon, has La Rumorosa-like pictographs in it. And um, some of the, the, the Colorado River was a pilgrimage uh, venue up to Mount Avakwami, which is uh, up by, uh, Nevada, up in Nevada, and we'll cover some of that later. So we know from the Kumeyaay, and we mentioned ethnography, that much of this rock art, not all, is shaman related. It's either direct shamanistic, what we call vision quest experiences that are being portrayed, or 
uh, ceremonies done under the supervision of a shaman, uh, either rites of passage where young people become adults or other types of ceremony based on creation or uh, their mythology. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is on this slide. Um, well, anyway, we'll look at examples of both. And like I said, there's a couple minutes worth of words, and then we'll just look at images. And I think by doing this, the image of, will be much more meaningful to you. So the Lurumos rock art style, and since I know there are a lot of friends out there and even some family members, you know what I'm going to say. Um, it doesn't just take up space though. We talked about the geographic footprint, but there's also a large inventory and our group discovers, I think about one site still about once a month or once every other month. And so we're up to, I don't know, about 165 sites. When we began this, um, the only other document that covered it in this way was Ken Hedges thesis from 1970. He had about 35 slides, uh, sites that he absconded from Malcolm Rogers uh, records to write his thesis with. And um, Ken's thesis was all there was up to that point. Uh, there was another book from 1988 uh, by Manfred Nock called The Forgotten Artist. And it's a very sympathetic portrayal, uh, almost tragic portrayal of the shaman and the kumiai. Uh, the photographs uh, in that book of the kumiai um, really upset me, to be honest. Um, I mean, not that Manfred did anything, it just upsets me that they were in that position. But this is, you know, we are talking about prehistory tonight, but I wanted to mention the kumiai are still living and still are remarkable people. It's, and San Diego is not just about La Rumorosa. Uh, Northern San Diego has a style called San Luis Rey style, which is quite a bit different. And the artwork that persists, a lot of it does have to do with rites of passage uh, portrayals that are painted by young women or men uh, when they are at the end of their celebration and they document their celebration with a painting. Um, there's a third style in San Diego uh, called the Rancho Bernardo style, which is uh, kind of in between the Los Sueño people that painted the San Luis Rey and the Kumeyaay that painted La Rumorosa. And Rancho Bernardo style, um, we have the world's authority in San Diego, and that's Gregory Erickson of Poway, uh, who's made it his life's mission kind of to recover photographically all the panels that he can. And I think Greg is up beyond a hundred panels, very extensive and intricate mazes, but no, nobody really knows why they were painted. It's just assumed that they were painted by shaman for some purpose. Um, Gregory's, uh, I, I don't think he has a book, but he does have a number of articles that are published on that style. So why did we need a volume two? Well, um, believe me, when I started volume one, I never uh, conceived that we would need or want a volume two, but by the time we finished volume one, it was um, apparent that we had a lot more material. And I was concerned that if we didn't publish it, that it would never get published. I believe in the next 20, 30 years that all of it will be gone. So anyway, these are some of the things that we put in volume two that were not in volume one. We added about another hundred sites. Like volume one, we added some supplemental sections on photography, learning opportunities, volunteering, um, what's going on in San Diego with rock art, that type of thing. And you can read some of the other things uh, there. Uh, all of those activities we put a link to, so you don't really have to go looking for them. And a lot of references. Uh, all the proceeds and a lot more go towards uh, the internship program. Oh, here's a good uh, little caption for the photograph on the right. This is from a site just west of the Colorado River, uh, north of Yuma, I don't know, 30, 40 miles. Uh, and it's, it's, it's actually close to the Intaglios in Blythe. Um, one of the shamanistic uh, portrayals is a flight 
flight to the spiritual world. So you see a lot of metaphoric paintings portraying flight. And in this case, the man, uh, the shaman uh, has wings. That's my interpretation. <clears throat> So let me move the toolbar here. <clears throat> um, just two slides on what makes Native Americans different from us. Obviously, they are different. So to me, as an outsider, uh, I would say that the most important ideal is that they look at the world, traditional Native Americans look at the world quite a bit differently than we do. Um, I've had some interviews with Native Americans, even with the media here in San Diego, and it became obvious to me that uh, many of them live a much more spiritual life than we do, and trying to get them to say like cardhold facts, some of them do not think that way. I mean, and it's really something to strive for, for us, but, um, you know, Sometimes, you know, it makes them vulnerable. <clears throat> so this is my little conception and trying to explain what happened. That doesn't mean that it's true. It's just my experience. So I took the story in the Bible and I wrote uh, about this in volume one, that we had Genesis. And as you remember from Sunday school, Genesis tells you that God said, that we had control over everything that he made for us on earth. Well, we didn't really do very well in doing what God said. That's nothing new. When the Spanish got here, um, this is covered in the book that's underlined in the middle of the third paragraph there, Tending the Wild by Kat Anderson, who's a professor at Berkeley. Uh, the Spanish really thought that they had found a garden of Eden that God made and since they were Catholics, you know, they took that literally. But God did not make that garden. The Native Americans of California made that garden, and they had been here for at least 10,000 years. And there's newer evidence that's pretty good that we may have been here much longer than that. We are not talking about the Cerruti Mastodon, which is not accepted science. We're talking about sites that are being excavated in Mexico that have good stratigraphic evidence, not ironclad, but better than Cerruti. So anyway, that was something that the Native Americans made because they had a deep understanding of how their ecosystem worked and lived more in harmony with it than trying to dominate and control it. <clears throat> so as a result of our, uh, meaning Euro-American culture in the last 500 years, um, things did not go well. Uh, finally, uh, sometime after the first book, in the last couple of years, uh, the governor of California acknowledged that there was uh, a genocide in a California. Okay, that was not even being allowed to be talked about in uh, California classrooms. Hang on one second, I gotta move this. <clears throat> well, so there's a lot of mythology around Native Americans, but the actual story to me is much more remarkable. They are a durable people. And if you want to know more about the story in San Diego, I refer you to the book at the bottom, uh, Richard Carrico's Stranger in a Stolen Land. So what made them different? Hang on one second. <clears throat> now, these are some generalizations, but there's truth in them. Um, Native American cosmology, they look at the world in a more inclusive way. They are part of the world, not the master of the world. Natural objects like rocks, water, mountain caves are alive. And so they get respect hang on one minute, they get respect as sentient beings or other particles or beings that have intention 
and a spirit or a soul. And so they're part of that rather than just um, being dominant over it. So academically, this type of philosophy or uh, spiritualism is called animism. And within that shell of animism, shamanism came into being a long time ago. Currently, there's evidence in South Africa uh, at a cave called Lumbos, where, and I've been in contact with many of these people who have been nice enough to talk to me. There are what are called geometric designs, basically, on pieces of ochre that date, uh, the dating is really solid, that show that mankind was already thinking geometrically. So they may have been on the threshold of being able to think about spirituality. And so shamanism has different forms throughout the world. And this is also uh, an object of contention. And, and I really think that this is because many people misunderstand that there are different forms of shamanism. Here in California, we ha have basically one type that may have come from Siberia. Siberia and Japan were connected uh, to each other about 30,000 years ago when many of the migrations to North America occurred. So those people did not just come here with their bodies. Uh, shamanism was well established at that time. So they brought over their religions and other culture. And so I think maybe that's where it came from. By the way, the Siberian rock art is shamanistic and it looks like California. It doesn't mean that it is, there's no scientific proof and um, maybe that's an aside too. We don't get to have mathematical precision in any social science. We get to have um, the most likely or the hypothesis that best, best fits the information or the evidence. And that's kind of what we have here. We're not going to get mathematical proof. And people who try to ask those types of questions in archaeology or anthropology, it's just not possible. And that's another group of people that complain about uh, the shamanism rock art model is that type of information is just not attainable. But anyway, the central paragraph on shamanism, um, one of the basic uh, tenets of shamanism is we have altered states of consciousness or trance. And trance usually in Southern California uh, could mean a, a number of physical austerities uh, or taking datura or Indian tobacco that had very high nicotine content. Both of those are hallucinogenic. Um, recently at a site north of here, um, datura pictographs were discovered within inches of datura uh, tobacco wads. So it was pretty evident uh, up to that time we had no certain evidence. It was really likely but unproven, and now we have pretty solid proof. So, um, you know, again, and, you know, I don't wanna portray this being about anti-whites uh, in terms of audiences, but let's be honest. Some people think, you know, this is well and good, but really it's kind of silly. It couldn't really happen and it doesn't, you know, it's primitive. And I think those types of arguments really fall short. And this uh, next to the bottom paragraph with green and blue in it might explain why. Uh, we do have the Bible and we have Christianity and many Native Americans are Christian today. Um, and that's good. This is a, a land of religious freedom. But think about it. If you were 70,000, 50,000, 5,000 years ago, what would you do? You didn't have any of that. You didn't have the Bible. You didn't have anything like that. And as far as we know, Jesus never came to North America. So what would you do if you had a developing mind where you started to think about death, that you were going to die, that you had all the uncertainties that would happen if you personally were dropped in the middle of the desert with no resources? Life was really a challenge in those days, and these people deserve a lot of credit for doing what they did. But um, when they start, began to have spiritual feelings, um, this is what came up. And it, it didn't just come up with the Native Americans. Shamanism exists in about 80% of all societies that have been studied for all time. 
So it's a very pervasive system. So therefore, it's not a surprise that the Native Americans would have had this. And one fact I'll pull out of, or a couple out of the bottom paragraph, is shamanism has been with us for many times longer than Christianity. And also, uh, until we had modern medicine, many of the pioneers would turn to Indian shaman to be cured and they had results, not every time, but neither does modern medicine. But there's a, quite a bit of evidence now that shamanism is legitimate and powerful. <clears throat> okay, some of the textbooks on shamanism are in this first paragraph, Black Elk Speaks, Black Elk Sacred Ways of Lakota. Uh, those are both, um, I think they had, um, I want to say writers uh, write down what they said, but they're the words of the shaman, the Native American shaman. In both cases, they were Sioux. And then uh, in the second book, Sacred Ways of the Lakota, uh, another shaman, Bill Lyon, wrote down uh, what uh, Black Elk said. And then uh, Bill Lyon took his 50 years of experience as a shaman and wrote a book called Spirit Talkers. I found that book life-changing. And I think for a receptive individual, uh, that book is really something. It was recently picked up by Cambridge, uh, but Bill Lyon uh, sells them directly on Amazon and uh, elsewhere. I think that book is really an amazing book about shaman being able to do what they said they could do. And why do I even talk about this? The reason being is that this rock art is legitimate. It really portrays what they saw in the spiritual world is not fiction, it's not made up. And I know that there's a lot of that going around today. And so I guess I'm taking maybe a hard stand about that. Um, let's see. The last part about shamanism is the altered states of consciousness. It's also been medically studied. Again, the world's authority on this is local. Uh, Michael Winkleman, uh, he's from, uh, he was trained at University of California at Irvine. He's in Arizona, either at ASU or AU or probably both. And his textbook, Shamanism, down here, uh, even though it was published in uh, 2010, he has a lot of more contemporary uh, writings. But uh, that book is still, I think, the best single source, but it is complicated. It took me months to understand it, but it, it is really good. So anyway, he calls, based on the medical science, rather than altered states of consciousness or trance, what we now know is in that state of consciousness, the whole brain integrates. And so he calls it integrative mode of consciousness. You have the lower brain, the middle brain, and the forebrain all integrating. And that's why you get access to a different set of knowledge. Okay, we're done with the hard part. Now it's uh, playtime. So here's a little image of, from Indian uh, Hill. And by the way, I don't know where the slide went, um, but it's, I guess it's coming up on D-Stretch. This is not what you see when you go there. This is a more modern technology in order to recover. Um, it doesn't make up pigment. It recovers what pigment is there and is faded either very faintly or uh, to invisibility, invisibility. That's what it looks like. And the Kumeyaay were here for about 4,000 years. The site has been excavated. Here's D-Stretch. Um, when you go to look at these uh, caves and rock shelters, um, hardly anything will survive out in the open uh, in our climate because there's a lot of rain and everything. Um, but so the picture on the left is what you would see if you were in this rock shelter looking at this wall. So this technology called D-Stretch uh, will convert these very faint pigment traces into this. And um, they're, the way that we use this for the people that haven't used it is we would take it on an iPhone or an Android phone and use it to screen um, 
you know, everything that we thought was likely uh, to hold rock art. And then when we found an area And we would take a photograph with a reuse. The computer version will do almost unlimited uh, applications to get the best image of the pigment. I put this in kind of as a joke. People want to, well, where did it go? <clears throat> um, some of the images that we have, the oldest rock art image currently is about 45 and a half thousand years old. And it's on an island in Indonesia called Sulawesi that has a number of very old uh, pictographs. And there's detailed information in both books about how to use that software. Uh, and also one of our group, Darren Sefek, uh, who lives in San Diego, uh, also has um, his manual on the uh, software. Okay, so what does La Rumorosa look like? <clears throat> um, here we have a typical image of a bunch of geometrics, um, but this is not at Indian Hill that you just saw, but doesn't it look similar? Uh, you have multicolored sunbursts, grids, concentric circles, triangles, and that, and um, this cave, uh, called Catavina Cave. It's near Catavina in Baja. You're welcome to visit it. They have guides that will take you there. Catavina has a hotel. It was actually painted by a sister group to the Kumeyaay called the Pachimi Indians about a thousand years ago. And they're all of a very large group of similar language um, people called the human language group. And Catavina is quite a ways down into Baja, uh, about an eight hour drive. Can't read this. Uh, concentric circles uh, by direct uh, asking Native Americans. Some say that it's a symbol uh, of a portal to the spiritual world. And also at the very bottom of this photo is like a whirlpool uh, pictograph. And that's uh, similar. When someone is in trance, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, when they're going into deeper trance, they often feel like they're in a whirlpool or vortex. <clears throat> um, this little drawing has some uh, good ideas that we can learn from it. This is Dripping Springs. Uh, which is south of Welton, Arizona. It's um, way off by itself in the Gila Mountains, which are very dramatic. As you can see in the background, uh, a site visited by Malcolm Rogers, who's kind of the father of San Diego archaeology. He was uh, more or less self-trained. He was trained as a geologist, went into self-training, um, uh, was an avocado farmer in North County, uh, somehow he got very interested in archaeology, and we can thank him for a number of the discoveries and photographs that we have. His dad took a lot of the photographs, but he was the first uh, scientist on site to just almost every place in Southern California, Baja, Western Arizona, and many other places. I think he also discovered the oldest archaeologic site uh, in San Diego. Uh, which is the Harris site. Um, I think it's uh, in north, north, uh, northwest San Diego, and it's about between 11 and 12,000 years old. Uh, the oldest site in Kumeyaay territory, uh, apart maybe from the Harris site, is a site in Hakumba, which is just short of uh, 10,000 years old. So what we can see in this is um, this lighter, the smaller man, the smaller anthropomorph looks newer because it's brighter. But often these anthropomorphs we found in La Ramosa get paired where there's one fairly normal figure and then one that looks more ethereal or more spirit-like. And that's the case here. The 
the lower man has like a dot, a circle head and some extremities and the man above him looks kind of normal. Then you have two snakes, each one paired to the anthropomorph uh, with their heads pointed down, which has some symbolic uh, meaning. So, Lizards, or they're called sauromorphs in the literature, are also very common in Lower Morosa. And about half the time, they have human characteristics, not this one, but we're going to see one in a minute. And um, part of trance in Lower Morosa shamanism and elsewhere has to do with the shaman and the spirit helper, which may is usually an animal, uh, a lizard, a snake, a sheep, um, a and there are reasons for that is in their original creation stories. Uh, these animals, these sacred animals that have, are now spirit helpers were the original shaman. And so they have knowledge that is not available to ordinary humans. And that's why they're called sentient beings. I knew you wouldn't believe me. So I put a picture of one in there. On the right is heart man, heart lizard. This um, photograph, uh, this is for Carrie, who's out there somewhere. Um, Carrie helped me to get to this site. And um, this is just one of the many in totally invisible uh, pictographs that are there. You cannot see this. And I had a great time photographing the entire wall, and there's a lot more there, but this is a really good example of a, what's called a therianthrope, uh, or a fusion of a man and an animal. There. These are questions that I would ask the students. We'll talk a little bit about the pigments. <clears throat> this is another shamanistic principle demonstrated by this. Uh, drawing. This is one of the petroglyphs or carvings into the rock. Um, there aren't really very many in Kumeyaay territory or what you would call the La Marosa tradition. However, there's one complex or one uh, gathering of petroglyphs in an area called Pinto Canyon uh, down by the border. And um, I'd have to get an update on this area. It really wasn't safe to go there recently. Uh, these photos are from quite a while ago, uh, taken by Tom Teske, uh, one of our group. And um, so I was gonna say, oh, it, it just, you know, not that you wouldn't wanna know this, but um, the man who wrote the only paper on this place was a classmate of mine in high school, Bruce Camerling. So um, the, a lot of these figures end up being oriented towards the morning sun. And part of the reason maybe is that the shaman would uh, trance or be in, in altered states of consciousness all night and in the morning would paint or carve. And so naturally many of these would base the morning sun. Um, this is also one of the few portrayals that may be a woman. Um, and I know of at least one woman shaman of Pumiai uh, in Northern Baja, I mean, who's still practicing. This is a site called Raven Butte, which is the subject of a book called Fragile Patterns, which is also a spectacular book. 
And uh, this area is on the Goldwater Range. Uh, you're supposed to get, and I really recommend doing it, uh, get a free pass in Yuma so that they know where you are uh, on there because they do have military uh, activities and you don't want to get caught in the middle of one of them. But anyway, forget all that. Raven Butte is just a beautiful site. And here you see many La Rosa like uh, geometrics. You have parallel lines, you have a sunburst, you have a whirlpool down at the bottom, another one, uh, a bunch of different abstracts. And so um, one thing we will mention probably later is that while they look abstract to us, does not mean that they were really abstract when they were painted. So, and then one little clue I had here, uh -oh. well, there was also a man uh, in there that I wanted the students to find. But, um, okay, we had mentioned that many paintings are shamanistic. In other words, they're painted by a shaman or shaman, they're painted by a shaman, but also sometimes things are done under the tutelage of a shaman. And this is part of the panel uh, de-stretched at Blair Valley, uh, one of the panels there. And so during these adolescent ceremonies, rites of passage at the end of the ceremony, in this case, probably young women would paint and they, often the spirit helper for these young women were rattlesnakes. And so they would paint diamond chains to represent the rattlesnakes and then perhaps put their handprint there. Uh, these are the two most common um, pictographs associated with rites of passage. And then there's a simple rectangle. I can't account for that, but um, there's the diamond chains more diamond chains and some handprints. That's just one of my inane remarks and highlighted in yellow. Rattlesnakes were, I think, not to speak for Kumeyaay, but um, from what I've read, power is not necessarily good or bad, like a rattlesnake has power, it can kill you, but um, it's how you use it. It's not just inherently evil. <clears throat> Another form of rock art that we have in the Rumorosa territory, and this one is in the southern end of the park, uh, Anza Borrego State Park, is our uh, what are called earthen art. And there's two forms, uh, rock alignments, like this one where you have rocky soil and you, you take a bunch of rocks and you organize them into a pattern. And, um, one of the things I, I think I forgot to mention is rock art is not usually made like we would consider art. It's made intentionally for a purpose. And you know, from what we understand, it's made uh, in seriousness, it's not frivolous. And so in this case, you have these spokes on this wheel between the inner circle and the outer circle. And what we're seeing is these uh, go to the equinox and to other astronomical events. They're not just random. The other form of um, earthen art are intaglios or ground figures. And that's where you scrape away the, the patina and pigment to make kind of a negative image. Here's another rock alignment, or it's kind of a combination rock alignment and intaglio because it looks like some of the soil has been scraped away. There were about 300 of these along the Colorado River corridor between the border and uh, Mount Babakwami. And this is just one simple small one uh, that was, um, what I wanna say, the river was cooperating by being in the background to demonstrate that fact. And some of these are very old, as old as um, 8,000 years. And uh, I said it's kind of a combination because to me, it looks like some of the soil has been scraped away like an intaglio. Okay, these actually are intaglios photographed by Rick Coleman, who's standing by the little car there, or by the big car, but he's little. And these may play into Kumeyaay cosmology. They're also close to the river uh, that has 
some references to creator twins and some other things. And I don't really want to speak for them, um, but there are references in their cosmology and creation to these stories. <clears throat> okay, uh, hang on. This is also a creation site or a, a ceremonial site. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a ceremonial site, even though it has petroglyphs and pictographs. In this case, and this is another Malcolm Rogers site, this is a by Secret Pass uh, by Laughlin, Nevada, or Oatman, Arizona, about halfway between. Um, first, uh, this is one section out of five, and I guess this is about 15 feet long. The petroglyph is carved into the rock, and then it's painted in black paint, and then over that it's painted in red paint. And we know, how would we know that this was a ceremonial site? Well, because there were Native Americans there. And um, one of their brethren was being cremated. And they said, this is how they use the site today. And um, Malcolm Rogers, um, in an issue of Pacific Coast Archaeological Quarterly, I don't know, five years ago, had a picture of him standing with a shovel in this exact spot. And so I really felt this was special to go there. Okay, uh, just black, back to Blair Valley a little bit to show you another variation on diamond chains. Uh, actually, a person in our audience, Gary Cassio, took this photo. Um, and this, this, the subject in the center right of the photo, I always wondered what that was. And then it became apparent to me exactly what it was, is it was a rattlesnake. Come on, I know you're there. The white arrow. This is a type of uh, rock art panel that they call a palm set, where you have many different layers and it's not done out of disrespect like graffiti. It's kind of the opposite of graffiti. By painting over it, the shaman or the person painting would be drawing from the power of the previous painting and painters. And so it's done in a way of respect. And also there's the time uh, window or the time interval here. Um, Native Americans were at this rock for let's just say 10,000 years. And so after a hundred or 200 years, the painting would disappear and they would paint right over it. So there are different considerations that they have. <clears throat> so in the trance model, which we're only gonna touch on briefly, because uh, I want everyone to go to sleep, but this is, this is tied to shamanism, and it was developed by work in South Africa that tied this, what's called the neuropsychological model, to trance and to rock art. And simply, I'm just going to open all these. Um, you have stage one on the very left, where you draw geometrics that we've seen. Uh, in stage two of trance, you see with your mind, um, you see iconic or representational figures pertinent to that culture. like. In those days, you would see sheep or you'd see deer, you'd see lizards, snakes, um, things like that, birds. And then in the third stage, the two would be combined as the person, in this case, the shaman, went into full trance. You would see both uh, fused together. These are a couple examples of stage one, where um, this is Blair Valley. Uh, this is the Kofa wilderness. And so, you know, these are just obvious geometrics. Stage one trance. This is another stage one trance, but I picked this picture just to show, this is Kofa wilderness, uh, to show how fragile uh, rock art is. This is painted on granite, but certain types of granite just sheet off. And you could see the bottom of the right geometric uh, has already disappeared. And for some reason in the Kofa wilderness, uh, that happens a lot. There are shelters that have paint 
all over the ceiling, but all the ceiling is on the floor. <clears throat> this is uh, from near Searchlight, an area called Aztec Creek. It's about 20 miles long and certain areas have rock art. And I really just picked this. It faces the morning sun. And I think what the artist was going for is some sort of sun halo or something that he saw the next morning. But I, I really just picked it because of the color. <clears throat> um, David Whitley, who's one of the, is probably the leading shaman proponent associated with rock art in California, trained under David Lewis Williams in South Africa, who developed the origins of this work, <clears throat> added to that model uh, six or six metaphorical ways of painting or thought. And then through the Rumorosa, we came up with the seven, which we'll see a couple examples of. But anyway, one of those metaphors, and it's covered in detail in the book, one of the metaphors is spiritual travel. And so how would you paint such a thing if you were going to the spiritual world? Well, um, sometimes they paint it with avian imagery, and sometimes they paint it with like traveling or walking is very common or running. And so I believe what's going on here, if the metaphor analogy is right, um, that here you this you have this man walking and he's actually walking towards another man. And we'll see more of that. This is from a site near La Rumorosa in Baja called Joaquin. <clears throat> Some of you have been here or have seen this before, uh, Vallecito. But take a look at it with what we've learned here. <clears throat> if you have the shaman uh, up on the top and <clears throat> at his feet, you have a number of what could be spirit helpers. Clearly there's a bird there, what looks like a scorpion. You can't really see it very well, but there's a, a good diamond chain near the foot that is to your right, uh, but you just can't see it all. And this is thought to be a badger symbol. So anyway, different spirit helpers that he is controlling. And that's an important part of shamanism as it borrows to other forms of thought where the spirits control him. And then let's see what else down here. Oh, and these so-called prayer sticks, uh, which we've seen some um, have to do with kind of like the staff of Moses or something like that, that they have power. So that may be what's going on there. And then down below you have the red arrows cupules and there's a row of morteros here, but they don't show up very well uh, by the yellow arrow. Now cupules are the oldest rock art form that's been yet discovered in India. There's some cupules um, dating from four to 700,000 years old. <laughs> Here, uh, Sears Point, uh, just a group of spirit helpers. And this is the Eastern margin of the Kumeyaay or the Patayan culture uh, who preceded the Kumeyaay uh, as they intersect with the Hohokam. And the centipede really looks uh, very Patayan-like and we've seen the snakes with the head down. Uh, these other elements, the, Animal on the right is, is a Hohokam rendition. This is a great site to visit if you haven't been there, um, just square miles of petroglyphs. There's tortoise. <clears throat> Another Sears Point um, panel right next to the other one. And you have a, an abundance of representational figures here. Um, there's an elk, coyote, a bunch of sheep or uh, goats, man with a bow and arrow. The gray arrow at the bottom is either corn or tobacco. I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then here, these are rare, La Rumorosa, or in any art form, really supplicating figures that look like they're either celebrating dancers, maybe, or in prayer or in homage uh, to a god. And we do have one. And this is kind of an interesting story. Yeah. Ron May, an archaeologist who um, studied Table Mountain and did a report on it, 
Uh, he didn't touch much on rock art, but he knew quite a bit more than was in the report, which I don't blame him for not publishing it. But he had me on a mission to find a couple of sites that he could not find. He, he had them at one time, but he couldn't remember. Them. So I was looking for the site that he told me uh, about, and I just couldn't find it. And so I sat down, started to eat lunch, and um, looked at the wall uh, in front of me. I was looking out the cave entrance uh, to an area, and I sort of focused on the wall across from me. And um, all of a sudden, this I didn't see it like this, because this is D-stretch, but I saw a white line. And it was about two or three feet away. So I took a picture of it, brought it home, and I was really amazed. And I sent it to one of my preceptors, and we won't name you, Jeff, but anyway, uh, he couldn't believe it either. And so there's also some red pigment down here. I don't know what that is. I never really pursued it because this is just so phenomenal. I'm unaware of any other supplicator in La Rumorosa territory. I mentioned a little bit ago that between stage two and three of trance, people experience a vortex or a whirlpool. But until a couple of years ago, Darren Sefik found this uh, pictograph. And boy, we were really excited. You know, again, this is an example. If you didn't know what was going on, this wouldn't mean so much to you. But to me, it's, it really stands out as uh, an example of trance that the shaman or whoever was verifying what was going on with him. And of course, he didn't have the neuropsychological model uh, to refer to because that was, wasn't really brought out until a few years ago. Uh, but this really meant a lot to us. This also, this is from the Cane Break Canyon system. And uh, it doesn't look very good because this is so invisible that I have de-stretched turned up as high as it will go, which adds a ton of noise. But it's a good example of stage three trance where you have a geometric figure combined with uh, a representational figure or an iconic uh, figure. And this is something you would expect to see up in Coso in the form of a petroglyph. But this is here in San Diego. Uh, and again, it's, it's really um, means a lot to find something like this. Part of trance also is you have bodily distortion like you have in this figure's uh, hands. And often the hands will ha have distortion like this. <clears throat> Here we have uh, three figures. You have, again, this relatively normal man walking in a walking pose. You have the figure down below that has hand distortion, uh, seven fingers, but you know it's obviously distorted. And then you have the stereanthrope with like a, a lizard head, uh, bird wings, human arms, and lizard body, I think we talked about. Oh, oh. well, the, his lower body was transferred into a sheep there. This boat type sheep. So you have one, two, three, four different uh, beings uh, fused into one. <clears throat> This example is from Portrero uh, in a village site. And it's just another example of a therianthro, which would be a trance uh, portrayal uh, in a pictograph. You have that vertical snake. You have, I'm sorry, you have a human head, uh, some kind of body, uh, lizard maybe, uh, and arms that are kind of hard to make out what's going on there, uh, bird like feet and a rattle tail. And on top of that, he's uh, standing on a geometric cone. So this would be a representation of stage three trance. Uh, this is actually from Mount Abekwami, a site called Grapevine Canyon, which has its own style. And I just picked this because again, this scene uh, has a bunch of geometrics and also the central figure, uh, of some type of anthropomorph with bodily distortion. If we, it's like six legs or maybe more. And then you have some animals scattered about. You have an equal number of geometric and representational figures in this uh, panel. 
back to Pinto Canyon on the border, another Therianthro. Uh, this is called the Condor Panel. And this is the only color photograph I've ever seen anywhere, again, taken by Tom Teske. Uh, you have a human head, bird wings, some geometrics below and around the wings going into enormous talons. Even though it's called a condor, I've never heard of any condor reference. It, um, but eagles, on the other hand, are really highly honored birds. And maybe it's an eagle. Uh, condors eat carrion. Eagle is a predator. Uh, I'd have to get you know, some verification on that. But that's why I think that way. <clears throat> this last phenomena, just a couple more slides to go. This last phenomena has to do with binary beans. And we've seen some of these already. And to me, this seems like it's portraying um, a regular or a kind of like a human countenance uh, with something else, whether it's spiritual or another type of, um, you know, being the, you know, I think it's, I would say in shamanism, it's portraying the, the shaman before as a physical person and as combined with the spirit helper in the spiritual world. Bird feed. <clears throat> this looks simple, but I think it's really magnificent. This is a site in the Kofa wilderness um, that, again, Malcolm Rogers was here. Uh, let's start again. I don't know how the arrows are going to come. OK, so we have our walking man again who looks fairly human. Then we have a lizard therianthrope man. And then we have this white figure that almost you would say he's ascending or flying. He's a lizard, very anthro, and it kind of looks where the tip of the red arrow is, like he might have wings. I'm just making that up. I don't really know because we can't tell. Um, but a very simple painting that to me says a lot within uh, the shamanistic model. <clears throat> this one too, very simple, but to me, I. If I wanted to come up with a way to paint this idea, I don't think I could do better. You have this little man, which um, may be symbolic, but he has little legs, little feet, and bodies. And I think I can make out an arm, maybe in black, I can't really tell. And also two different colors of ochre. And some ochre, especially the brilliant red kind, like on the left, was highly valued. Uh, came from as far away as Havasupai Canyon and the Grand Canyon. Oh, uh, somewhere I forgot to mention Paul Campbell's book on pigments. Uh, if you're interested in pigments, is a great book to read. Paul Campbell was an amazing archaeologist that passed away way too early, but he wrote some amazing books, and the book on pigment is really helpful. Okay, back to our idea. We have our little human man, and Capturing him with a lasso at his feet is this larger figure that's more amorphous and has bird-like feet. That's about the only thing we can tell about him. And he's larger or more powerful. I think for a simple little painting that this says a lot, little man, big man. We're going to see a wide angle of this, but um, again, Darren and Tom found this cave that many people had looked for and failed to find. It had been lost for many years. Uh, people had put a foot in here in decades. They found this, and it's up in the McCain wilderness. When I sat here, it took me about an hour to find a pictograph. And I knew it was in there, I, I thought it was, I was in the right cave. If I was in the right cave, then I knew it was there, but I could not find it because it was buried under um, soot or charcoal. This wall is actually black. Um, D Stretch was able to pull it out, which usually will, not always. But here I sat with prayer sticks. I can't remember how many, seven, nine, ten, 
at my feet off to the left, looking at the morning sun coming into this cave when the, you know, about the same time of day that the shaman was probably painting this. Give me a second to move this. Some of you have been here on um, many photographs of this. David Munch's photographed it, Manfred Knack photographed it. Um, this ties into Kumeyaay mythology about the twins. Here you notice that the two beings pretty much look alike. They're not to me at least, they didn't seem like one has a vastly different countenance than the other one. Apart from the story of the, uh, the twins in early creation uh, Kumeyaay cosmology, I have no idea what this would mean, but I also know that there is not a panel like this in all of the Southwest. This is Echo Rock or WikiWip, and um, I think it's probably the finest panel in San Diego, but I have no idea what it means. This is part of what this whole thing is about. You know, not specifically, but to have a Kumeyaay tell us what their culture means to them. And that means someone other than me or someone other than from the outside world. And I think that's really important. And, you know, I think after all that's happened, you know, we can give them that much. That's all. And thanks very much for uh, listening. So if you have any questions, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer them. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate you presenting this. And uh, on behalf of all of our attendees here tonight, which topped at one point over 90, uh, really Fantastic to not only see these hidden and these fantastic pieces of rock art brought to light, but to see these hidden pieces brought to light and discussed and celebrated in a way that they haven't for many, many years, if, if ever. Uh, we do have several questions. So at this time, I'm going to focus first on those that were submitted over the time of your chat. And then afterwards, we can turn our attention to some uh, live questions by the audiences. Uh, look okay, like sure. we had some great questions earlier on. So it might take a minute to get through them. Yeah. So give me one moment here to pull this up. All right, we're just gonna work our way through the list here. Oh, sure. Sorry, we had some initial comments at the very beginning, which were not questions. All right. Um, First question you had here, Dom, was from Angeline, uh, which is, uh, what is your definition of Kumia in your own words, in terms of who they are, their territory, them as a people, and them as a culture? Okay, well, um, it's, again, I hate to keep saying this, it's very well described in the book, and the Kumia have uh, several high quality websites that they tell you who they are. But um, let's just say as a person who has studied them, um, it's a name given to uh, a human, Y-U-M-A-N group that resides mostly in, centered around San Diego Imperial counties. Um, they were preceded by what are termed the Patayan people. And they're termed the Patayan people in large part because we do not know what language they spoke. And so at a certain point, we can't trace the Kumeyaay back because there's just no historic record of them or verbal record of them. So, I mean, it's largely the people that have lived in this area uh, would be the Kumeyaay. It's thought, uh, it's thought that they came from the East, but I'm, I don't really know how solid that evidence is. And the people that lived in San Diego uh, before they moved to the mountains and the desert, I mean, before, white civilization was here. It had nothing to do with us. They previously lived on the coast because the marine resources were so readily available. Um, and like the Harris site is one example of a coast site that was earlier than any desert site that's yet been discovered. So um, 
you know, they've just lived in this area. I think that's the main prerequisite. And they speak from the human language group. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question we had here. Just one moment. Uh, the next one comes to us from Randy uh, Baker, which was, you said initially that in about 20 to 30 years, all these sites are, well, by your estimate, expected to be gone. Uh, it's rather bleak. And could you possibly elaborate uh, what drew you to the, this pursuit? And can any action be done uh, to preserve these sites moving forward? Um, you know, it's, it's one of the really double-edged swords of rock art. Um, you know, everybody wants to see them, me included. I'm not innocent. But, you know, with that comes a certain danger that, you know, 90 people or 99 people out of 100 would see the site and honor it. And then somebody will come along and people are getting arrested all the time for defacing rock art or carrying it away or trying to carve it out. Um, you know, it doesn't really take much. And, and sometimes it just, it gets damaged. You know, people don't intend to damage it, but you know, it happens somehow. Um, that's one cause. And then the other one, like we talked about the Rancho Bernardo style, urban sprawl uh, mowed right over these grand boulders and people built homes around them. And, you know, Ken Hedges and Gregory uh, Erickson had told me that sprinkler systems, you know, uh, man-made sprinkler systems actually destroyed a number of these rock art sites just due to water damage. You know, it's, it's, so there's all of those things, but also when you think of granite, in many situations you think, boy, that stuff's really hard, but it's a crystalline rock and it delaminates. And so even in the cave, you know, granite is not impervious to, you know, problems uh, with, you know, the, the basement membrane that the paint is on falls apart. And then, you know, there's also the paint. Like I had the little jab in there about Home Depot. You know, if you went to Home Depot and you painted something, it would last 15 years with their paint. You know, the fact that these paintings, I mean, there are paintings on this planet that have been with us for 45,000 years. But it doesn't seem to be the case in California. There's something different here. And so the paintings don't last very long. I can notice a difference when I go to Blair Valley or to other sites in Anza Borrego that they do not look like they looked when I first saw them, you know, so they don't last very long. That's what I mean. We've, we've been able to buy a ton of time with the technology of de-stretch um, paintings that we could never have seen. Now we can see and include and hand them back to the Native Americans. Uh, they exist again, if only in a photograph. Thank you. Um, we had a few more here and then we are getting close to the public uh, comment where we can turn it over to live. Uh, actually, this one came up a few different times by a few different audience members. Uh, this concerns rock art and uh, rock art along both the Colorado River, but also particularly that in Arizona. Both comments that, oh yes, there are sites out there. Uh, they also seem to be a little bit better preserved in some instances. And also, can you uh, elaborate on the connection between them and the areas in La Lumerosa? Okay. Well, um, let's, since we don't, we don't have, that's one thing. That's a subject I didn't bring up that really interesting and horribly deficient is dating this rock art. To the best of my knowledge, I mean, I found an article that dated some sites in Baja um, done by, I think it was done by Procayo, uh, who's like the prominent Baja rock art person. Uh, Antonio Percayo, maybe. But anyway, he did an article where he dated some La Rumorosa, and I showed it to David Whitley, and he was unaware of any dating. So there is virtually no dating around on La Rumorosa, so we don't know how old it is. And therefore, we don't know who really might have painted it, whether it's Batayan or Kumeyaay. We can, uh, one of the ways of looking at it is by the style of La Rumorosa. And I use the word sometimes La Rumorosa like, because, um, you know, it looks like La Rumorosa, but it may not be in Kumeyaay territory. But along the river, it's a pretty safe bet on either side. Uh, Malcolm Rogers visited and he called it human. Uh, I mean, Y-U-M-A-N. 
uh, and other people say that human Native Americans lived there. So it may have been Cocoa Pa, it may have been Pai Pai, it may have been Kumiai. Nobody knows who was actually in that spot. And so it's, I would call it La Romorosa like uh, art. If it's in San Diego, then it's the county, then it's pretty secure that it's Kumiai. If it's an imperial, it's pretty secure that it's Kumiai. When you go into Arizona or up the Colorado River, you can say that it's human related or La Rumorosa looks like La Rumorosa, but who the actual artist was, you know, is unknown. So um, since it looks like that and has characteristics of that, you know, it's included in that. So I hope that answered it somewhat. Oh, so the, uh, let me say the dating that Burkayo came up with is surprising. Uh, I think remembering his article was about 1400 to about 1700 for the paintings that he dated, but he only dated, I can't remember, three or four panels uh, out of, you know, we have about 2,250 on this side of the border, and I'm sure at least an equal number in Baja that you could tie into uh, La Rumorosa. So virtually 99.9% .9 of it is undated. So we can't really tell who might have painted it. Thank you, Don. Uh, next question we had here was just about your professional background. Could you actually share a little bit of your uh, affiliations, where you basically came to know this material and uh, what your PhD is actually in? Um, as Gary uh, Cassio, who's in the audience, who designed these books, who took a bunch of scraps that I wrote on and some photographs, I'm embarrassed to say I took, and created books out of them. Um, he knows that my favorite part of the first book is the foreword, where my father uh, started a project out near Hakumba. Um, it's now the nudist camp, which I perfectly enjoy, and I've stayed there a couple of times when I was doing research for these books, um, and it was too cold to camp. Um, at that time, he had a Kumiai work group, and I remember one man in particular who went by the name of Joe Young, who was very wise, quiet, and stable. My father, to be honest, was coming off about 20 years of alcoholism, and um, he spent about 18 months with the Kumiai, and he really got the message. And in that forward to the book, which was on the website, I don't know if it's still there, but if you have a book, you can read that, is a story about my dad's spiritual awakening and trying to communicate that to his teenage son, me, at that time. And I remembered what he taught me, and that's why I wanted to write about it, because I, I thought it was so important that this art form, uh, it's not really art, but we call it that, you know, is spiritual. And anyway, what he taught me and what Joe uh, taught, me, uh, taught me, you know, stayed with me. I ignored it for a while, but then it came back. And um, that's kind of what got me involved in this, um, you know, coming back to archaeology. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have three last of the pre-recorded questions. Then we can turn it back over to the audience. Yeah. Uh, this first one is... <laughs> This first one is about uh, the whirlpool designs and rock alignments as uh, having similarities to labyrinths. Can you comment on those at all or expand on that at all? Yeah, I, I hope this answers it. Um, we didn't see the Rancho Bernardo style, but I bet there are images online for you to look at and they're very labyrinth-like. Is that what the person was asking? Uh, yes, they were asking concern. Uh, basically, they were fascinated by the whirlpool design. Yeah. Hoping you could actually comment more mm -hmm. on that. And then also uh, rock alignments as possible labyrinths and things like mm -hmm. that. So. Um, the, I think they're kind of related. <clears throat> the whirlpool and um, like the vortex. The vortex and the whirlpool are common perceptions in the middle of trance. And of course, trance is being medically studied today with uh, what they call hallucinogens. Now they're called uh, entheogens um, <clears throat> because the, the benefits of altered states of consciousness, hang on one second. 
the benefits of altered states of consciousness medically induced and used for treatment are profound. Many of the people that experience um, trance or altered states of consciousness or integrative mode of consciousness, they're all the same thing, <clears throat> uh, often feel like they're in a labyrinth or in a whirlpool or in a vortex. They're going through trance. So it's a common perception um, to have felt that. And so I, I guess it ends up in a lot of rock art because rock art, the shamanistic types of rock art are thought to portray trans experiences. I hope that helps, but if not, they can ask, uh, ask for more. But look at the Rancho Bernardo style online or look up Greg Erickson online and you'll see uh, some images that I think will help. Perfect. Uh, and I'm sure we might get to, I can get a few more questions here following up. Yeah. Uh, second last question we had pre-recorded at least over the time is actually more of a comment, but I think it directly ties into what you were saying earlier about the interconnectivity of early rock art just speaking to the human condition, uh, which is referencing the Altmyra cave system out in Spain and the rock art, how that is stacked on top of itself over different generations as well. Uh, the idea of the sort of a universality of certain experiences for early peoples. Uh, so that just, I'm not sure if you had anything you'd like to add to that, but the Altmyra caves in Spain were brought up. Uh, I'm sorry, David, I'm having trouble hearing you a little bit. Oh, not a worry. Uh, I was just like, we had a, received a comment concerning the Altmyra caves in Spain uh, and the similarities of how that is a multi-generational site that sees earlier rock art drawn on top of the, uh, a replacement. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't know um, where that information came from and specifically, but in ethnography, um, and again, you can learn a lot about this. Uh, the, the problem is the ethnography on the painting, strategies, I guess you would call them about doing multiple layers and that the ethnography, you know, like if you do a search through documents, uh, you can use windows to do word search. And that's what I had to do because you're dealing with about 5 million pages of ethnography. And I'm just not that young to, to deal with that. So I would word search and part of it would have to do with um, finding that this layering effect um, was used, you know, to draw power. And I think it's kind of a, a lot of what we've learned about um, painting and that is from a researcher uh, in South Africa, but he mostly is in Siberia doing field work and his name, uh, God, I can't pronounce it, Roswadowski, like Andrew, something like Andrew, but Ro Andrew Roswadowski. He talks a lot about Siberian shamanism portrayed in rock art. And I, I think that's where the idea came from um, about that. And his articles are very uh, accessible, readable, and he has a lot to say, and he's a good writer, and he has great photographs of the rock art. And when you look at what he has published in his articles, he's on Academia, EDU, and you know everywhere else, um, you'll see that looks just like Southern California. So I hope that helps. So, and then the last question we had here before we turn it over to our audience uh, was actually, uh, we've already slightly touched on it, the ideas of advocacy and pre preservation. Uh, is there anything that can really be done today, uh, especially with things like the most recent appointment of Deb Holland, uh, that can be done no. to inspire, excite, and hopefully advocate for the preservation of these sites moving forward. That's and perhaps in an international probably, fashion. Yeah, that's probably the most important question of all, you know, concerning rock art. Um, well, I think this comes down to control what you can and, you know, the rest, you just have to let go. Uh, to control what we can, I think, you know, most people that uh, know a lot more than I do about, you know, the big picture, uh, say education is about the only thing we can do is to educate people, you know, that this uh, rock art is not silly or frivolous or made by primitive people. And that they're actually quite advanced people. They did not have our technology, but other than that, 
you know, they were every bit as cognitive as we were. Archaeology, anthropology, psychology, you know, all the fields say that, that we basically had our intact modern brain for at least 10,000 years, and most people say 40,000 years. So the idea is that um, to have reverence for the artwork and reverence for the people that made it, and hopefully that gets around um, to enough people, um, you know, that it makes a difference. There will always be people out there that want to take advantage of this, and it, it's just, it's a shame. And, and I mean, you know, I don't want to be too preachy about this, but to me, it's, it's all tied into racism and treating people, like I had mentioned, the debate in archaeology right now is over what we call alterity. And the word alterity in anthropology and archaeology means the other, the other culture, the other people. They're not like us. They're less than us. And that's why we have to study them and take their culture apart, because we're rich, white, elitist from Western culture. That's it in brutal terms you can find in many contemporary archaeology articles by people who are part of the other. And, you know, they're kind of tired of being the other. They want their cultures and their people respected and not treated like there's some insect on a slide. And I'm sorry to be so negative about it. I've seen Kumeyaay beaten up personally, and I really don't like that. And in San Diego, and yes, a few months ago. And so this whole concept of treating other cultures like they're less than us has just got to stop, but I, I really don't think it's going to. But we can do what we can do on this, and that's try to win more people over that this stuff matters. Um, let me give you one optimistic thing for all my bitterness that I just spewed out. Uh, I gave a talk on Bill Lyons' book. And I could not get out of that place. People kept me there for two and a half hours because they're thirsty for spiritualism. And that's to me what the, you know, forget rock art, forget Pumiyai, forget all of that. You know, we're all headed in the spiritual direction, whether we want to go there or not, we're headed there. And I think that's the most important umbrella for Native Americans, for rock art, and really for all of us. If we could look at things and treat everything with dignity, um, a lot of our problems would be solved. So, that's my pedantic lecture for the night. As always, well said there, Don. Uh, and I know from experiences as well, what you're saying are, is not uh, unusual, unfortunately, but it is also one that could end on a positive and could be seen as a resurgence right now. I know that many of our partners are claiming that we're in a period of uh, renaissance actually, for many of the tribes and work like what you're putting together here work on the internship programs, work in these books and in the schools really is allowing for a recapturing, a re-enlivening of indigenous culture. Uh, and it's uh, coming back to those same peoples. Uh, yeah, now I think putting the Native American on the, on the cabinet is a gigantic step, you know, and I hope that's going to be helpful. You know, um, these people have been through a lot and, you know, I would like to see them help a little bit. And part of that is just being part of this lecture and other activities like it where the respect for what they've done and the respect for who they are now, you know, gets out there. And, you know, the more people that hear it, I think it makes a difference. Absolutely. And with that, unless you have anything else to add, I'm going to turn this to our uh, members no, attending here tonight. Yeah, uh, we actually have Thanks. some uh, time remaining, a few minutes left for some questions. I do know that there were a few others. Uh, I think we had a special request from Angelina. She's still here and would like to uh, raise her question. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to ask this question. Uh, Mr. Laquani, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're having trouble hearing me. I'll put my microphone right to my mouth. Is that better? Oh, thank you. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, um, I am of indigenous descent and I am an academic in anthropology in a California university. Um, and so, I, and I'm a rock art specialist. So I come across some very interesting, I'm, I apologize, it's a little bit of a long-winded question, but. 
Well, I, I come think- across some very interesting pushback from people who are my seniors as professors and in anthropology um, about the idea of studying rock art, rock art. And I feel like it wouldn't be the same if I was in Arizona, but California has this very unique attitude toward rock art, probably because of the population density. But anyway, yeah. um, so uh, I, so it's kind of like they say strange things like, well, you know, you really shouldn't say that the Native Americans were very spiritual. And the thing is, they don't understand that animism. How do you politely handle those kinds of criticisms in your experience? Um, well, what you're saying is totally true. Um, <clears throat> there's, w- will you do me a favor and write down my email because I want to send you some articles that would be very pertinent to your situation. Um, written by a woman that I think she teaches in Texas, an archaeologist. Um, you can see my email, right? Uh, Don, I can provide that to Angeline directly. In the chat. Okay, well, I, w- I want you to do that because I can answer your question much better by allowing you to read what people in your situation have written and published. But anyway, to answer for everyone, um, yes, what you're saying is true. Archaeology has had several crossroads and they have not behaved well whatsoever. Some of the crossroads were um, you can't have pre Clovis people and the careers were destroyed, people were maligned, and then there was rock art dating. Careers were destroyed, people were maligned, and then there was shamanism. Careers were destroyed and people were maligned. And it's not good behavior out of educated people. And um, David Whitley that I had mentioned is uh, a, you know, probably the prominent rock art scientist in California, maybe the country, and he, has had to, had to threaten lawsuits, has had to write bitter, um, what do you call it, responses and stuff to other uh, archeologists. And it was really unnecessary. You know, there, there has to be, I had mentioned that this is not mathematics. There has to be a little bit of latitude for interpretation, especially by, um, you know, um, peers but also from the indigenous people. I'll tell you one scientist that has really set the bar and he's highly respected is Richard Stoffel. He's at Arizona, I I get him confused, either Arizona State U or or AU. And he writes rock art articles in our area, including the Kumeyaay area. He wrote one on Kanab Creek. I can't remember the name, but you can email me. Um, And he does all the science and then he takes Native Americans to the sites and asks them what they think. And it's really spectacular. It's the best sort of modern ethnographic approach I've seen in any rock art article. He's widely esteemed, but I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that think he's crazy. Sir, sir. He also does a lot of work with a Paiute and a woman named Kathleen Van Vleck. So yeah, so you've else. heard of Richard. Yeah, yes, but if, I'm saying it out loud in case anybody else is interested. Well, there's Whitley, there's uh, Stoffel, there's Ken Hedges locally. Um, there are other people that are right. You know, David Lewis Williams is, you know, I think he's like catapulted rock art into respectability. But for the audience, he deals with the San people of South Africa who have the oldest shamanistic tradition in the world and unbelievable rock art. You know, there's just too much. Indonesia has a shamanistic model. China, Siberia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, India. I mean, it's, you know, I mentioned China. Uh, trying to think about, you know, there's a number of areas that have this. The, the, but the problem, again, we're coming home to, how many of those countries have you heard about, you know, having rock art and shamanism? Just about none, because the focus is on Europe. And everybody thinks the Paleolithic was defined by Europe. The Paleolithic is the Stone Age, um, the Upper Paleolithic, forty to ten thousand years ago, when all the magnificent paintings in Europe were done, and they're thought to be shamanistic. But that's that's just you know one side of the story, and and this alterity that you're talking about. What about everybody else 
mean, they all had Paleolithics too, but you don't hear anything about them. And that's, again, part of the problem. This third book, I take this on as a worldwide um, phenomenon. And, you know, I'm really impressed by the information from all these other cultures that, you know, maybe they didn't have a Le Chavez, where, you know, the magnificent uh, Paleolithic cave paintings, but they had other things. And that doesn't make them, you know, nobodies. And, you know, especially China has a ton of rock art. None of it's dated and hardly any of it has even been studied. So there's a lot of other cultures that have been ignored. And I think the true story is to bring out those other cultures, you know? So I hope that somewhat answers your question. But, um, and we are getting close to the end of our time here. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, do we have any final questions for Mr. Loponi? Uh, everybody would like to, you can feel, uh, speak you know, directly into the mic. You do not need to uh, raise your hand or anything. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Loponi, uh, my name is Velma. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I have a, a question about uh, Carlos Castaneda who, and those like him who actually tried to understand shamanic experiences uh, by working with shamans uh, or medicine people. What would you say about them? Would you say that, that they were, their experiences uh, may have been authentic or were authentic? Because <laughs> I know that he studied, I believe he either was an anthropologist or archaeologist or studied anthropology or archaeology. Well, I know that he was really uh, disparaged by the uh, by archaeologists and anthropologists who were scientists. They really disparaged him. David, can you repeat it for me? Because I... I'm having trouble understanding it. The microphone is not good. Can you summarize it? Unfortunately, I do apologize for Velma as well. I was actually uh, struggling to hear you as well. Uh, if you'd like to type it to me, I'm happy to uh, voice it to Don on your behalf, though. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I typed it to Annalisa. I believe uh, it was, what would you say about the experience of Carlos Castaneda and those like him who have tried to understand shamanic experiences firsthand. Ah, okay. Uh, Don, did you understand that time? No, I'm sorry. It's my hearing. It's not you. N not a worry. Uh, so Carlos Castaneda and others like oh, him yeah. uh, try to apply a more personal uh, experience where actually they experience the shamanistic yes. traditions. Great question. Uh, what were your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, Boy, this is a great question. I am really glad you asked us. Uh, you know, Carlos just passed away. Anyway, he went to UCLA School of Anthropology, where David Whitley went. David Whitley was one of his students. And, uh, you know, I, I believe it's been pieced together that what Carlos wrote was true in principle, but may have been kind of like a a fable or, you know, a story that was true in principle, but the facts weren't, you know, exactly there. But what he was saying was actually pretty on the money. Okay, so taking that, um, yes, he probably had a shaman because the person that he put in his books was well known in Baja. Um, by the way, the UCLA School of Anthropology is, is kind of, um, not mock, but, you know, it's not really disparaging. It's kind of like funny. It's called the UCLA School of Shamanism. So because they put out a lot of archaeologists that uh, were shaman proponents, which is a good thing because UCLA is respected in that field. So I would say that I think he helped popularize the modern idea of, of ancient shamanism which to me is a good thing. I don't care you know, if it was literally true or not. When I read it, it makes sense. And also before 
him, and I think where he maybe took his cue was um, uh, an, an anthropologist that was, I think he was at uh, University of Chicago, Mircea Arlati, who was from Eastern Europe, maybe Romania or, so, or something like that. And he wrote a book called Shamanism, which is still the number one selling book in sh on shamanism. And it had, he deserves credit for bringing the attention of shamanism to the Western world. And a lot of his ideas were on the money, but he here's people criticize him. And that's where shamanism and rock art ends up getting painted in the same brush. They criticized him because he wanted to come up with a universal model of shamanism that applied to all cultures and to all times. And when that hit rock art, and a lot of people got sucked into that, um, Daniel First, who was the California uh, researcher, um, Casey Chang, who was, I think, at Yale, but also introduced uh, Chinese shamanism to America. A lot of people got sucked into that. And because of Ilati, shamanism gets a bad name. And um, I think Winkleman took Ilati's ideas and explains them very clearly in his book on shamanism, Winkleman's book on shamanism. In a couple of pages, he explains them very clearly, but it actually took modern Chinese scientist who got his doctorate in Alaska and studied Eskimos named Feng, Chu, Feng Kuo, uh, F-E-N-G, and his last name is Q-U. He wrote an article on KC Chang that you can get on the internet. It is the clearest explanation of shamanism that exists that I've found. And Feng cleared up a lot of stuff in China and um, for the Paleolithic, for agricultural societies and modern shamanism. And Feng Qiu based his work on an earlier scholar, a woman named Hamian, uh, Roberte Hamian, who studied shamanism in Siberia. And she told us all along the actual truth, but nobody listened to her. Part of it was uh, she published in Russian and French, but she had figured this out a long time ago the correction to Ilati through her own field work. And anyway, I'd never heard of her either, but I thank you and I are friends. So I um, paid attention to his writings. And this article, I think, straightens out shamanism for everybody. If, but nobody, I don't think, has even read it yet. But hopefully they will. And here's a case where education, uh, thank you's explanation, could really boost the shamanistic rock art um, what do I want to say, reputation or status, because he, he really makes sense out of all the misinformation. So that's what I'd say. If, if uh, I th He has a new book out, but this article is free of charge uh, online. Excellent. Don, thank you yeah. so much. Oh, sorry. This is Marilyn. May I make a comment? Yes, Marilyn, I think you're going to be our last one tonight, but please do proceed. Thank you. Well, Don has inspired me to start thinking about contacting our new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Halland, and, you know, sort of bringing, yeah, I'm sure she knows about the importance of saving rock art, but, uh, you know, if all of us who listened to this tonight wrote to her and, uh, you know, tried to start the ball rolling, um, there's got to be ways uh, she could work with Mexico, particularly in regard to, I mean, there's rock art all along the, the border, as we know. And, um, you know, um, it, this is so important. We all, we all know how important this is. And maybe let's, let's see if a new Secretary of the Interior can start the ball rolling. Thank well, you. I'm very hopeful about her. But, you know, here's another uh, example, to me at least, of alterity. Think about Mexico. Think, you know, they don't have anything. They don't know anything. Yeah, well, they do. Mexico, Baja, including La Romarosa, are state parks, and you have guides, and they're organized, and you have explanation, and you have concern. You don't have that here. You have a little bit of it, like Borrego. You know, I mean, really, tell me about Borrego. 
they'll let you see one site. There are lots of others. They have site stewards. I was one. And I submitted new rock art sites. They went nowhere. We are behind Mexico in terms of concern for rock art, maybe not scholarship. I, I think we're leading in scholarship, but the, the vital thing about preservation, Mexico is ahead of us. Uh, every photo I took in Mexico went to Mexico City before I could publish it. I mean, they're careful and they, you know, they're concerned. They want to know what's going on. And, you know, it's, um, it's really something to see. I was really surprised by that. But I mean, this is not something that's a secret to anybody in rock art. Um, I think our leading researcher of Baja locally is Don Leitlander, uh, who I think now is retired, but he was at uh, ASI. And so um, he has a big website on Baja, anything you want to know on Baja, plus he knows uh, things too. But you know, we have a long way to go. And I think Deb Holland is, I mean, it's like there are so many problems to solve. Uh, I'm sure she'll work on culture, but she's really got to save the people that are alive today. You know, rock art's one thing that living people are, are quite another. Don, thank you so much. I think we have some amazing yeah. comments and questions here tonight. Uh, unfortunately, everyone, that is the end of our program here tonight. So one last time, I would very much like to thank our speaker tonight, our evening with an expert, Don Laponi. Uh, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to everybody for hanging in there. It was a long night. <laughs> and like talking to you guys. <laughs> and also, thank you, of course, to all of you who... Uh, to everyone here who joined us as a participant for this evening, we are very fortunate to have you. Uh, please do keep an eye on upcoming events. The museum has another Evening of an Expert in just a few weeks on April 10th that will feature uh, our local BLM wildlife, wildlife biologist, Peter, uh, Peter De Jong, and he'll be coming on uh, out and presenting at that time. I am sharing with you our events calendar, so if you missed it the first time, you can keep an eye out for when and where that will be taking place. All this information is, of course, also on the museum's Facebook and website uh, as well. Uh, I've, if anybody has any final questions, I'll be sticking around for a few final minutes here to answer anything to provide our contact information. And certainly, we encourage you to not only participate in these events, but to show your support for anything else and everything else going on at the museum. Uh, <laughs> Don, very nicely done there as well. And... Thank you so much for all of you. I hope you have a great night and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Please do continue to attend and support your local IVDF. That was a great museum. You can really, you can see the rocks from the oldest site in um, the desert in Southern California, or right yeah. museum. Yes, and we also have some great new programs coming up, including the one that Don's helping us with right now, uh, which is our Kumiai internship program starting next summer. And if you'd like to be involved in that, if you'd like to show your support for that or anything else, please do reach out. I'll put, provide the museum's information again in the chat here for you. And if anybody would like to purchase any of Don's books, you can feel free to reach out to us here as well. I know a few of you have done so already and you can always give us a call or email and we'll happily process that payment and even mail the books to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Well done, Don. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, Don. Yeah, that was good. We covered a lot of ground. You did amazing. You got to wait till. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Sure, thanks very much, everyone. See you around town. Are you ready to leave? <laughs> All right, uh, I think that is just about everyone here. I'm going to terminate the recording here now. Don, thank you again. Yeah, that was.